So now that we have finished the silent age, we are going to go ahead and move into film in the 1930s and the world of talking. Um, so this is the beginning of what's called the golden age in American cinema. And we're going to talk about what that means in just a second. But besides movie, um, besides the advent of talkies in the 1930s, uh, what else was going on in America at the time? Hopefully at least one of you knows. Maybe you've shouted it out at this point. I don't know. But if you did, you should have said the Great Depression. <laughs> um, so as I'm sure most of you have already learned in eighth grade history um, or 11th grade history, uh, the Great Depression was a period of time in the early to middle-ish, late-ish 1930s um, where the United States was in a huge economic depression. Um, jobs were hard to come by. People were starving. Farms were failing, etc. So... Um, ironically, even though um, people were very, very poor during the Great Depression, Hollywood and the film industry was actually doing great because films were exceptionally popular during the Great Depression. Um, and I would have you guys talk here, but it says it on the very next bullet point. Why do you think that is? Well, going to the movies became um, an escape. For some people, it was a literal escape. Uh, movies were relatively cheap, and they could... Um, go spend time in a, a theater um, during the day for shelter. Um, but also, uh, it was a metaphorical escape. And I'm sorry, my doggie's about to go outside. Okay. Um, so um, this was a way for people to stop uh, thinking about the uh, doldrums of their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so after the jazz singer, the vast majority of films were talkies. And if they were not talking films, then that was um, intentional, uh, just like we talked about with City Lights, how Charlie Chaplin very much made City Lights a silent film, almost kind of as an act of like artistic rebellion. Um, the things that were popular during the 1930s were musicals, epics, biblical epics, um, historical epics, uh, stuff like this. And there's a couple reasons for that. One reason is that people wanted to go and see these big, larger-than-life films. Um, but another reason is something we're going to talk about today. But first, we're going to talk about the studio system. So the 1930s, as I mentioned, is the beginning of the golden age of Hollywood. And something that reigned during this golden age was the studio system. So talent uh, would sign contracts with studios. So rather than um, you know an actor or actress today um, who might who would sign contracts individually per film, um, or uh, you know production staff and stuff like that who might sign contracts individually. Um, you would sign a contract with one studio and you would do all your films with that studio. Um, so this is when a lot of those major studios that uh, we're familiar with today and some that are uh, kind of from eras past, we don't hear about RKO very much today. Um, this is when they're gonna start gaining a lot of power um, through this studio system age. So during the golden age of Hollywood, the studio rules, that's going to change in the future. Um, so these major studios, Paramount, Metro Goldwyn Meyer, 20th Century Fox, Warner Brothers, um, they're all gonna start uh, becoming bigger uh, household names during this studio system. Um, now the studio system uh, was actually often very exploitative because um, when you're signing a long-term contract with a studio, let's say you sign a contract and it's for a lower wage, but then you become a big star. Um, and well, it might be a matter of time before you can negotiate or be out of that contract for a higher wage. Um, or let's say you are a young starlet and a producer makes a move on you and you reject him. Uh, oh, well, you're not getting good parts anymore, buddy. You're not getting, you know, to get any starring roles. So the studio system uh, was not good um, for actors, actresses, but also for um, everyone on down through writing staff, um, production teams, etc. Okay, but the big reason, the big influence during the golden age of Hollywood is production codes, or what's often called the Hayes Code, or the Hayes Codes. Um, so, during the early 1930s, people started to complain that films had become too lewd, too risque. And 
that probably seems laughable to us today, considering how uh, risque many films can be. Um, but actually, a lot of films in the 20s were pretty controversial, even by modern standards. Um, and so a lot of those films are lost to time because of poor storage um, of the celluloid film um, from back then. Uh, or they're just lost to time because we've literally lost them. <laughs> um, but people have started to complain, um, calling films like, even going as far to call them like pornographic, which they were not that far. Um, so the Motion Picture Production Code was put into place, um, and it was enforced by uh, an office by this man named Hayes, uh, starting in 1934. Now, it... Um, it existed prior to 1934, but was not heavily enforced until 1934. And this was basically Hollywood's way of saying, well, people are starting to complain about films and their content. So we're going to censor ourselves before the government can censor us. So there. Uh, and they ended up really screwing over a lot of artists. So, excuse me. And the... Um, the Hayes Code influences media all the way to today because it's responsible for a lot of um, stereotypes and tropes and ways that we, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I can't think of it, but uh, display or, or um, project certain situations or concepts. So um, as I said, the government, uh, the Hayes Code was created to prevent censorship, but ended up creating very strict self-censorship. But filmmakers would find sneaky ways to get around the code. You can see here on the right, this is an example of a pre and post code Betty Boop, um, who was supposed to be a kind of like sex symbol. On the left, obviously, we see pre code Betty Boop. Um, she's in a much skimpier dress. You can see her garter, which would have been very scandalous for the 1920s. On the right, you can see a more cleaned up um, Betty Boop for the Hayes Code. So, we're going to look at the Hayes Code mo more in depth after we watch Duck Soup, but um, to give you kind of a uh, top level look at um, what the Hayes Code contained. Um, it's a lot of showing that laws should be respected, crimes can't be portrayed. So if someone is a criminal, they either have to become reformed or they have to be punished. Um, no nudity, no overt portrayals of or references to sexual behavior. You can't mock religion. You can't show drug and alcohol use unless it's totally necessary to the plot, but narcotics are absolutely forbidden. Um, there were some exceptions for cartoons about the law being respected um, or about violence. Um, you could not have any detailed descriptions of crime. Uh, the wording in the Hayes Code actually says such that would uh, basically give instructions to someone watching, <laughs> which I find very, I don't think anyone's ever watched like Ocean's Eleven and been like, oh, I'm going to go do that. Um, you can't use revenge as a theme if the film is set in modern times, which is part of why biblical and historical epics were so popular at the time is because they had fewer restrictions uh, on them. Anything that was considered perverse could not be depicted in any way. So um, there's no specific Hayes Code against homosexual relationships, but that just falls under um, the blanket code of sexual perversion, um, because this was back in the 1930s. Um, and interracial relationships were also strictly, um, strictly prohibited. And that is because at this point in time, interracial marriage was still illegal. Um, the sanctity of marriage had to be upheld. So if you showed adultery, you couldn't make it look like appealing. The people who were um, cheating would have to be punished in some way uh, by the end of the film or would have to reform and uh, change their ways and, and be um, repentant. Um, you couldn't swear, you couldn't blaspheme, and you had to respect the United States flag. So um, pretty harsh censorship rules that uh, really limited filmmakers. But it's also really fun because a lot of filmmakers started trying to get around the production codes by using um, euphemism, by using cleverly placed uh, props or sets. Um, and it, uh, they, the Hayes Code has really shaped a lot of our media, even to today. Um, there's a reason that uh, queer characters, there's a trope called bury your gaze. And there's a reason that queer characters are often killed off in media. And that's because of the Hayes Code. Um, if a character was queer coded, meaning they um, were written to 
be gay without be explicitly saying they were gay, um, they would have to be punished in some way, even if they weren't a villain by the end of the film. So that's why a lot of them uh, end up dying. So um, these tropes still influence our media today, and we're still trying to unlearn a lot of the um, a lot of the filmmaking habits that we developed during the Hays Code. Okay. So key term for you guys, we're going to start talking about some more shots and we're going to start with um, an establishing shot. So establishing shots are just a shot that, um, just like it says, establishes a setting, a world, of uh, the context of what's happening in the movie. So uh, looking at this, at this shot, um, I want you guys to tell me maybe what's going on in the context of this film. And I'll pause for a second so that you can converse. Okay, hopefully you paused there and discussed uh, what this, what scene or world this shot is establishing. Here's another example of an establishing shot from Lord of the Rings. Um, I believe this is from, this is from Two Towers or Return of the King. I think it's from Two Towers. Um, where we first see Gondor. So what, what sort of tone is this shot trying to establish? Go ahead and talk for a second. Pause me. Okay. And then this is a shot from the beginning of The Walking Dead. So what do you notice in this shot? Um, what are they trying to establish about the world? What tone are they trying to establish? What are they trying to tell us about this character at the bottom? Go ahead and pause me for a second and talk about this establishing shot. Okay. Um, I also want to talk today about framing. So this is another important key term, one that we will talk about a lot. Framing is when a director sets up a shot to emphasize a certain subject. So they want to call attention to one particular or a couple of particular people um, or an object or something. So here you can see they're using framing. Um, they're using the environment to create frame a frame. However, you can also use people. And framing doesn't always look very blocked off like this. Sometimes it can just mean that the protagonist is in between two people, um, that those two people are emphasizing the protagonist. Okay, so let's talk about the Marx Brothers and Duck Soup. So Duck Soup came out in 1933, a year before the Hayes Code was enforced in full. Um, however, it was still uh, influenced by the Hayes Code and, in fact, criticizes the Hayes Code uh, in the film. Um, it was a critical and commercial failure. Uh, audiences hated it. Critics hated it. Um, but a lot of that was because it was seen as anti-government and anti-war. Uh, which, I mean, it is explicitly anti-government and anti-war, but it was seen as being excessive. Um, it was extremely critical of Hoover's go government, um, but it was also extremely critical of pompous people, the wealthy, um, intellectuals, stupid people. <laughs> um, it, it was very critical of everyone. Um, but specifically, it attacked um, the Hays Code, Hollywood, and uh, the government and America's what they saw as warmongering. So the Marx Brothers, um, these are a group of four brothers. They were actual brothers. Um, and these brothers were um, initially vaudeville uh, performers who transitioned to making uh, films. They're super iconic. Groucho Marx is uh, this one here with the grease paint mustache and the eyebrows and the cigar. Um, and he is where you get Groucho glasses, so those glasses that have the uh, mustache attached and the eyebrows. Those are from Groucho Marx. So um, the Marx Brothers here, we have Chico up top. Harpo is the one who doesn't talk and does mime. Uh, Groucho is the sort of prominent one. And then Zeppo is the one at the bottom. He's the, the straight man, the everyman. Um, so a lot of Marx Brothers comedy is marked by farce. Uh, so that means that it's situations that are highly unlikely and highly exaggerated to prove a point. Um, they also use a lot of chained gags, which is a uh, joke after a joke after a joke or jokes that kind of like um, build or snowball on each other. And their work is highly satirical, especially Duck Soup. Duck Soup satirizes all of society ruthlessly, but especially the American government. All right, so with, with that, we are going to get started on duck soup, and we will talk about 
the production codes more in depth when we finish. I hope you enjoy.